So hi everyone, welcome to the first event organized by the Booth Asia Real Estate Alumni Group together with the Alumni Club of Singapore. We have students and alumni joining us from all over the world today. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening wherever you are. Real estate has become a very important part of institutional investors' portfolio. And we are very excited to have two real estate experts join us today to discuss strategies to find excess returns in this particular asset class. First, we have Professor Peliadi. He is the clinical professor of real estate at Booth. He has over 40 years of industrial experience and his research effort focuses on issues surrounding institutional real estate investments. He will be sharing a presentation for the first half of this session showcasing the real estate strategies and returns. You should have received a copy of the spikes in your inbox yesterday. In the second half of this session, Chris Fossick, CEO of JLL Southeast Asia, will join Professor to discuss real estate strategies in Asia and globally. Chris is a Booth alumnus. He has over 30 years of real estate experience in Asia and the UK. Prior to JLL, he was the president and CEO of CBRE Japan, and he currently serves on the Global Remuneration Committee for the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyor. We have also set aside time for Q&A towards the end of this session, so we invite you to submit your question via the chat function in Zoom. All right, I'm sure we are all looking forward to this session. Let us get started. Professor, over to you. Thank you, Amos. Welcome, everybody. So when we talk about excess returns, I think it's important to define how we're going to measure those excess returns and what the data sources are in doing so as a platform for having a broader conversation. So I'm going to present uh, today uh, a copy or uh, a version of the paper that Mitch Bollinger and I had published in the Journal of Portfolio Management last fall uh, in the PREA sponsored issue uh, pertaining to real estate. So in terms of the big takeaways, this paper is actually a follow on paper to an earlier one I wrote in real estate economics that came to the same set of conclusions. And it, this current paper spans the 18 year period ended in 2017 and looks at the risk adjusted net of fee performance of non-core funds. And by non-core funds, I mean value-added and opportunistic funds. And I'll be a little bit more specific about that in a moment. And like the earlier paper, this current paper suggests that non-core funds underperform core funds once you adjust for fees and risk to the tune of approximately 300 basis points per year. So this is not an inconsequential finding. If you think about 300 basis points of negative alpha per year, given the size of the private equity real estate world, you're talking about approximately seven and a half billion dollars a year in fees that in some sense are excess fees, fees that shouldn't be paid. So the study in the paper will also address why this perform, underperformance, excuse me, is persistent and what we can do possibly to mitigate this underperformance going forward. So in terms of the main points of the talk, the first thing I'm gonna talk about are the data. What do the data look like? How should we think about them? What are some of their advantages and disadvantages? Then I'll talk a little bit about how promoted or carried interest create certain asymmetries that we need to make uh, explicit. I'll talk about the law of one price, which basically says that any two assets that have the same future expected cash flows ought to have the same price. So I'm going to use leverage relative to net core returns to create a risk return continuum. And then I'm going to use those two tools to look at the historical data. And then after that, I'll look at some holding period sensitivities and then finally, why does this under persist, underperformance persist and what we might do about it? So first of all, I apologize for this screen or this screenshot, I should say, 
but this is the raw data. So let me start with the core returns. So core returns are measured um, in the US by something referred to as NACREF's Odyssey Fund. You see the ODCE here in parentheses. Um, in broad numbers, round numbers, over this 18 year period, core funds with a modest amount of leverage produced a gross return of 9%. The investment management fees payable to the general partner were approximately 100 basis points, and therefore the net return was about eight. There are two sources of value add funds here in the United States. NACREF has one of them, and a, a data vendor by the name of Burgess has the other. Mitch and I put together a composite, excuse me, value add index. Its annual return, gross return over this period of time was approximately 12.8%. The fees were approximately 300 basis points and therefore the net return was 9.7. And then finally, Burgess also reports the net return performance of the opportunity funds. So those opportunity funds over that period of time had a gross return of approximately 15 and percent. Investment management fees, fees payable to the general partner were approximately 400 basis points. That includes both a combination of the base fee and the promoted or carried interest, such that the net return was approximately 11 and percent. So for those of you that are not necessarily that familiar with institutional commercial real estate, these three buckets, core value and opportunistic, represent the main strategies by which institutional real estate investors deploy capital. Core real estate represents the low risk, low return strategy. Core properties are properties that are well built, well located, well tenanted, and are generally in one of four property types, apartments, industrial, office, and retail. On the other end of the spectrum are the opportunity funds. So think about firms like Apollo, Blackstone, Brookfield, Carlisle, Colony. These are the high risk, high return, high octane, if you will, real estate investments. And the investment landscape covers the waterfront in the sense of it, they could be land deals, condo conversion deals, development deals, B pieces and CMBS offerings, high yield or mes debt, by their very nature, opportunistic funds move to where they think attractive risk adjusted returns can be found. And in the middle somewhere are the value add funds. Uh, as a real estate example, you might buy a old tired shopping center, uh, reskin the facade, retenant the building with retailers more consistent with uh, the trade area. It's a less risky strategy than opportunistic, but more risky than core. Uh, and in terms of the leverage ratios on these different strategies, core funds generally have less than 25% leverage, value add funds somewhere between 45 and 65%, and opportunistic somewhere between say 60 and 80, 85%. It's harder to know where those leverage ratios are on average, for uh, the value add and opportunistic funds. And before I forget, let me also say that what Mitch and I have dealt with in this paper are averages. So we're looking at the average return from a series of opportunistic funds. Uh, there's much dispersion in that performance. So we're at this time, we're only commenting on the average return by strategy. It's possible that a fund or a family of funds does better or worse than that average. And I should also say that Burgess, this data vendor, collects net returns directly from the limited partners who invest in these funds. So it, Burgess, avoids some of the self-reporting problems found in other indices. So here's a visual picture of the kind of data that we're talking about. The blue squares represent the gross returns by various strategies, and the red circles represent the net returns. So with regard to core funds, we're looking again at Odyssey, and in particular, we're looking at the net Odyssey return. 
in terms of value add funds, we're looking at primarily Burgess's value add net returns. And finally, with regard to opportunistic, we're asking ourselves, or actually, I should say we're investigating the net returns from this opportunistic set of fund performance provided by Burgess. And the economic question is, how should we think about the risk return trade-offs between these three strategies? And just by way of context, this green diamond represents the NACREF property index. So in the United States, the NACREF property index represents this unleveraged return series on core properties um, before you consider investment management fees, cash holdings, uh, leverage, and all the other things that accompanies a fund. Okay, so let me also be clear that particularly with regard to the non-core data, that is to say the value add, but in particular the opportunistic funds, there are some problems with the data. There's an inconsistency oftentimes amongst general partners as to how they report their returns. Particularly with the opportunity funds, there's staleness with regard to the mark to market. Because we're looking at investor returns in the US, there's an incomplete capture of the fund universe. And Burgess doesn't characterize the opportunistic and value add funds as between domestic and foreign debt versus equity and other characteristics that might be of use or interest to us. Um, and part of that is just how these funds are formed, right? So if Blackstone has a global fund and can invest literally anywhere in the world, then Burgess has no idea as to, how, as to the performance of Blackstone's individual properties in various markets. Okay, so the next question or the next topic is, as I said before, understanding how promoted or carried interest creates certain asymmetries. So the bell-shaped graph that you see in front of you is just some hypothetical distribution of fund level returns. And as I'm sure all of you are aware, the way that a promoter carried interest works is of course, that above some preferred return pref or hurdle, the general partner receives a percentage, typically 20% at a fund level of the excess profits. So excess profits, again, being over some hurdle, typically around 8%. But in this example, just to make things easy, I made the hurdle equal to the expected return of this distribution, which is 12%. So the, blue, the dark blue shaded region represents the carried interest paid to the general partner as the funds return exceeds the preferred return. And therefore the investor's net return is the green shaded region. And I make an issue of this because of the following. When you calculate the standard deviation of the gross return, you have a calculation based on the entire distribution. When you calculate the standard deviation of the investor's net return, you have a smaller standard deviation in terms of its computation because clearly the dispersion is smaller. And you'll hear some general partners in my mind irrationally argue that to promote reduces the risk because the standard deviation has gone down when you compare the gross to the net returns or the standard deviation of the gross and net returns. I think that is inappropriate, misunderstands risk in the sense that the investor retains all of the downside risk. So to say that the investor's risk is reduced by virtue of the smaller dispersion after the general partner's promote is paid strikes me as unfair to the uh, limited partners. So in what uh, I'll show you in a moment, I use the standard deviation of the gross return as the measure of the investor's risk. Okay, and the second tool that I use is this law of one price, which as I said before, two assets with the same expected cash flows ought to have the same price. Otherwise, there's an arbitrage opportunity. In private equity, the or private real estate equity, 
the application of that law of one price is as follows. I can take any unlevered vanilla core property and leverage it up. So this blue dot represents some level of expected return and risk for a core property. And the blue curve represents the change in the expected return and the standard deviation as I leverage it up. And just for reference, here's that unlevered return now levered to 25%, then 50%, and then 75%. So I'm going to use this levered risk return continuum as the benchmark by which I'm going to assess either positive or negative alpha. So just arbitrarily, I picked two points for a given level of risk. The green square represents a particular fund that outperform non-core fund, excuse me, that outperformed what the investor could have generated by simply leveraging up core, whereas the red square represents a non-core fund that underperformed what the investor could have produced by merely leveraging up core. So in the first case, we have positive alpha, and in the second case, we have negative alpha. And that's essentially how I'm going to think about whether or not non-core funds outperform core with leverage. So one other thing I want to say for, my, um, for the attendees that are less familiar with private real estate equities, this risk return continuum is a curve, not a line. So in sort of standard or mainstream finance, we think about a linear risk return trade-off. And it's essentially because we assume that we can borrow at the risk-free rate or some constant rate. Instead, what I'm suggesting here is more in keeping with practice, as the borrower leverages up, the lender charges a higher and higher coupon payment for the, for the increasing possibility that the borrower may default as the leverage ratio increases. So in some sense, here's a bit of a picture, here's a bit of a behind the scenes kind of look at how Mitch and I uh, examine the different costs of indebtedness over time. So the gray shaded region represents the risk-free rate along with some structural differences between mortgages and bonds. The gray shaded regions plus the green shaded region represents the interest expense a borrower would have incurred had the borrower used 25% leverage. The gray plus the green plus the purple regions represent the cost of borrowing at 50% leverage. And the gray plus the green plus the purple plus the blue represent the cost of borrowing at 75% leverage. Right, so you can see that when you think about a leverage strategy, the risk-free rate is changing over time and the spreads are changing over time. Interestingly, the spreads were quite low before the financial crisis, which as an aside tells us that lenders aren't necessarily great at pricing future risks. Those spreads blew out after the financial crisis then it was a great time to be a lender as well as a borrower. And since then, spreads have generally receded and stabilized and somewhat true of the risk-free rate as well. So in our calculations, Mitch and I assumed a five-year holding period. So every fifth year, we looked at the cost of indebtedness for our, not, me, for our core funds, leveraged them up accordingly, and as you'll see later on in the presentation, we also looked at different holding periods. That's why you see this cost and indebtedness over the entire time period. Okay, so let's put the tools to work. So here are in this red circle, the net returns from core real estate investing over this 18 year period. And again, all we did is we leveraged up those core returns, and you can see us increasing the leverage ratio in increments of five percentage points to create this risk return continuum, which any institutional investor could have implemented. And we would argue is the benchmark by which we should think about 
net returns from the value add and opportunistic strategy. So again, the blue squares represent the gross returns. The red circles represent the net returns on value add and opportunistic respectively. And then again, we're going to gross up the standard deviation of returns such that they're based on the gross return rather than the net return because we believe that better captures the actual downside risk uh, that the limited partners are exposed to. So net returns, the law of one price, and this volatility adjustment are, excuse me, are the modifications we make. And before I get into the actual numbers for a second, you can see that the value add gross returns barely lie on this risk return continuum to so to foreshadow the results it's clear that the net returns underperform the core with leverage strategy and while opportunistic gross returns lie above the line the fees and costs are so substantial that the net returns also lie below that risk return continuum so when you look at the actual numbers you see that value add funds underperformed a core with leverage strategy by approximately 325 basis points per year. And the opportunistic funds underperformed by approximately 285 basis points per year. Okay, so that to me, that's the big takeaway from this presentation. Investors, limited partners merely had to leverage up core to replicate the kinds of returns that their value add and opportunistic funds produce on average. And had they done so over this 18 year period, they would have outperformed the average non-core fund by approximately 300 basis points. So let me move the conversation in a different direction. And let's just say, Pagliari, I don't agree with your, um, treatment of risk. I think investors don't pay attention to risk. I don't really care about risk. All I care about are the net returns. And I think it's a fair argument given how difficult it is to measure risk in practice. So what we did here is rather than think about alpha in this vertical direction, which is normally what we do in finance, we asked ourselves, what happens if we think about vertical, excuse me, what if we think about alpha in this horizontal dimension. In other words, what if we just try to replicate the net return of value add and opportunistic by leveraging up core, how much leverage would we need to apply to a core fund in order to replicate the net return? So for value add funds, the answer is the leverage ratio somewhere between 30 and 35% on a core fund would have produced the same net return as the value add index. And again, just to remind you, while it's difficult to know for sure, most of us believe that the average leverage ratio of a value add fund is well in excess of 30 to 35%. And replicating that same analysis for the opportunity funds, how much leverage would you need on your core fund the answer is somewhere between 40 and 50% leverage to replicate the same net return as the opportunistic fund, right? And so again, just to repeat myself, opportunistic funds probably have leverage ratios of somewhere between 65 and 80% or so. Again, difficult to know, but most of us would think that, that this number of 40 to 50, 45 to 50% is far less than the leverage employed by the opportunistic funds. So that's, in my view, a fairly shocking uh, result of this study. Uh, I'll skip over this slide. Basically, it just says that this current paper and the earlier paper produced the same results with slightly different data sets. And so then the next thing I, we asked ourselves is what do the holding periods look like? In other words, is it just simply a matter of the, the global financial crisis so torpedoed non-core returns that any comparison over this 18 year period 
puts the non-core funds at an extreme disadvantage. So the first thing we did is we set up what are referred to as these mountain tables. And this particular table, oops, I'm sorry, is for the uh, value add index. And what this table says is pick any entrance dates and any exit dates, and we will compute for you the alpha over that particular holding period. So the study or the performance that I just described before uh, has investors investing at the beginning of 2000, 2000 and holding through the end of 2017. And this is the negative 325 basis points of return you saw on the prior slide. If you wanted some shorter holding period, you could think about any combination that it's at least six years in duration. And you see from this chart that in every period, value add funds underperformed core with leverage. Even true before the financial crisis, right? So to me, this is a really damning comment about value add funds on average. And then we replicated the same kind of mountain chart for the opportunity funds. Again, the same answer as before, which is to say that if you look at the entire holding period from the start of 2000 through the end of 2017, you had approximately negative alpha of 285 basis points. That's the number in the lower right-hand corner. And if you wanted any shorter holding period, you could have gone through this exercise and you see that with one exception, all of the returns are negative, including before the financial crisis once again. Okay. And if you don't like our conclusions, <laughs> I'm sympathetic. I was joking with Chris earlier that I used to have more friends in the private equity real estate world before this paper than after. But <clears throat> there are five potential adjustments that would have made the negative alpha actually worse than is shown in the paper. One of them is that the because of the stale mark to market, uh, stale marks to market, particularly the opportunity funds, the volatility of the opportunity funds is dampened, right? So less risk uh, correlates to a lower required return. Uh, that probably uh, would not be the case if we did not have the staleness of the marks to market. When you move into riskier strategies, value add and opportunistic, there's a lot more idiosyncratic risk, or to say it another way, there's, a, there's much greater dispersion in the returns amongst general partners. So as an investor, you're taking on more risk. There's also more illiquidity. These core funds are traded in open-ended funds, which means within reason, investors can get in and out at uh, some estimate of net asset value. In the core funds, excuse me, the non-core funds for the most part, they're closed end. As an investor, you have to wait until the fund is liquidated to get all your funds back, or there's a secondary market for LP units in these closed end funds, but particularly, uh, I should say often or typically, uh, you sell your LP interest at a discount to the estimated net asset value for the benefit of liquidity. Uh, the other thing that happens with regard to um, the non-core funds, particularly the opportunity funds, is you might make, let's say, a $100 million capital commitment, but eight, only 85 to $90 million of that commitment is actually called. And how should we treat the remaining capital? Does it earn the risk-free rate? Not sure. And then mathematically, I don't want to spend a ton of time on this. There's serial correlation in the returns. There's generally more so in the non-core returns, which also artificially dampens the volatility estimate. Here's just a picture that shows you uh, in blue, the opportunistic returns and in green, the value add returns. And the only point I'm trying to make here is in terms of the mark to market staleness, you see a huge return in the midst of the financial crisis for opportunity funds. Clearly, that wasn't the case in real time, but the reporting with the stale marks to market suggests this strong return in the midst of the financial crisis. Uh, 
why and what can be done. So I know we're running out of time, so I'll be quick with these last two. Okay, so um, Mitch and I have taken a novel approach here. Consultants generally focus on the general partner's process and quartile performance. I don't know of another study that's looked at the data and applied this relatively simple technique to understand whether or not funds have outperformed their core alternative. Uh, it's difficult to distinguish luck from skill, particularly in small samples. So maybe limited partners think that this has just been a really uh, long stretch of bad luck for their opportunistic and value-added managers. Uh, Dick Thaler at University of Chicago has uh, coined a term called mental accounting. That is to say, we treat cash inflows from different sources differently. For example, in your personal life, you might treat your cash salary income different from how you might treat a bonus or an inheritance or some sudden slug of cash. And maybe this kind of behavioral accounting goes on with regard to core versus non-core, and that explains some of this persistence. Uh, the one that I'm fond of, at least in the US, is that many public sector pension funds are underfunded. And as a result of being underfunded, they're sort of forced to move towards alternatives with higher expected rates of return. Core returns don't move the needle far enough. So there's a certain amount of yield chasing, swinging for the fences. It goes by different names by pension funds that are underfunded as they try to heap, hit, excuse me, or meet their actuarially assumed rate of return. And then what might we do to mitigate this substantial cost? We might place more leverage on core funds and less on core, non-core, excuse me. Demand better data from the GPs. It's still a very opaque world with regard to non-core funds. Might reduce the base fees. One that I'm particularly fond of is replaced fixed preferences. Again, the typical fund documents say something like the preferred return equals 8%. It might be wiser to replace that 8%, that fixed number, with some kind of index. NACREF leveraged 40%. The NAREED index leveraged 30%. Pick whatever you think is applicable or appropriate. Compute the promotes on unlevered returns. Some large investors already do this and or place a ceiling either by a dollar amount or a percentage on the promote uh, that, such that it can't exceed this upside. And some investors are already doing that as well. So I'll stop there. I've already gone past my time, which is the typical academic approach. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Chris. Thanks very much, Professor. Uh, that was great uh, to, to, to listen. I realize how much I sort of missed my time at uh, Chicago. Uh, so thank you. That was uh, great, insightful. I, I, if I could sort of just start off, um, probably just uh, asking you this sort of obvious question is that, you know, right now up until uh, probably the period of COVID that we're in at the moment, the real estate sort of uh, world was seeing sort of record amounts of capital pouring into it. Uh, it certainly, I think, since the global financial crisis uh, become a much more popular asset class uh, for investors uh, around the world. And JLL's uh, research uh, showed that in 2019, so the last year before this, uh, a record $180 billion uh, was raised uh, by private equity GPs uh, around the world, and there was some 900 plus uh, individual sort of funds that this was raised in. Um, and over 60% of that uh, in 2019 was earmarked for non-core, uh, with the balance being uh, core and core plus uh, and, and some other ideas just around alternatives. So with, with and, and this investment capital is coming from sort of sophisticated uh, investment houses, you know, whether it's sovereign funds or pension funds or endowment funds, etc. I, I just wonder with, you know, your very compelling research, um, why we continue to see 
um, such sort of uh, huge investment into sort of non-core strategies and great to have your sort of view around that. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Yeah, um, I think there's several explanations, one of which is, and this is going to sound a bit boastful, but not meant to be, uh, the paper just came out last fall, right? So I think it takes a while for these ideas to disseminate into uh, sort of the mainstream thinking. Um, but before this presentation, Chris and I and some others were talking about when you think about these results, they're actually very Chicago-ish in the sense that they advocate for something approaching market efficiency, right? That the passive strategy tends to outperform the active strategy net of fees. Um, so I think at Booth that answer resonates or that conclusion resonates pretty deeply with most of us. Um, I think uh, other than Norges Bank and some others, I think the word hasn't quite gotten out yet. Uh, I also think that, as I said before, a lot of the domestic U.S. public pension plans are substantially underfunded. And so they look at the non-core, particularly opportunistic funds, um, as one avenue by which they might beat their actuarial assumed rate of return, which is somewhere around generally seven to seven and a half percent. You can't get to seven, seven and a half percent when, you know, let's say 40% of your uh, portfolio is allocated to treasury bonds trading at, you know, let's call it 1%, maybe on a good day. So there's motivation to reach for riskier assets. Uh, the conclusions of the paper are relatively new and novel. I'm very sympathetic to the notion that uh, it's difficult to measure risk, right? And so in the paper, we have the benefit of measuring ex post returns, which leads us into a calculation of the volatility or the riskiness of those returns. When you're talking about risk going forward, it's obviously just an opinion, it's just a judgment about what those risks might be. And I think the other thing is, as we have tended to move away from the financial crisis, generally speaking, our memories about risk start to fade, and it's just sort of human nature, we move to, towards riskier and riskier strategies. Um, so I think those are the explanations, and I would just say as a footnote, when you talk about uh, money raising or fundraising, particularly in the opportunistic space, it's dominated by a few large players, right? So the, the Blackstones and the Brookfields of the world raising multiple billion dollar funds, um, they've sort of taken the mantle and run with it. Yeah. Hopefully that I mean, it's, it, it, yeah, that's great. Um, that, that's great, Professor, thank you. I mean, it's in, interesting that you said that this research has only just been sort of concluded and, and therefore maybe hasn't uh, got out to as wide an audience as possible. I. We, we were chatting earlier about, you know, um, my, my time uh, at, at Chicago, which is over 15 years ago, when, you know, there was compelling research in the equities market around the fact that active managers um, could not outperform index, the indexes. And, you know, that, that was sort of cutting edge at the time. And here we are sort of 15 plus years later, uh, where this is common accepted fact. Um, probably not been attributable to, to Chicago now because it's out there in the broad audience. But, you know, it was sh Chicago research that first sort of looked into this. So I wonder, you know, if we fast forward sort of the next 10 years, whether uh, we will see similar uh, movements uh, of real estate sort of uh, investment capital moving more into core. Uh, yeah, it, it, what, one thing I... Chris, sorry. Chris, I interrupt you for one second. My apologies. Yeah, so I, I completely agree with what you've, of course, said. Uh, and I would attribute it largely to Gene Fahm and his work on market efficiency. Um, I would also say, though, that I don't want these results to be misinterpreted to suggest that non-core real estate investing is going, going to go away from an institutional perspective. I don't think that's the takeaway. Instead, I think the takeaway is that there has been substantial underperformance on average 
And I think in, in the future, investors will be more discerning about paying incentive fees to non-core general partners who haven't performed where the definition of performance or excess performance given this event is tied to some passive index rather than just a fixed hurdle, right? And so I think because of that, there probably will be a consolidation in terms of the number of firms and therefore the number of funds offered to limited partners as those limited partners, those investors become more sophisticated. Sorry, Chris. Yep, no, no, that's fine. To, to, uh, Professor, what we see, what I often see on, on the ground is I, I wonder to what degree when you know, the GPs go out and they raise the capital and they quantify it as a sort of opportunistic or value add, um, but when those funds are actually deployed in the market, it's, it's often hard to find those pure opportunistic or uh, value add opportunities. Um, and I often see some of these funds going into what I would really call, call more of a core investment. Um, and because we've had some pretty good tailwinds in the real estate industry since the global financial crisis, caused by the fact that you know, leverage uh, is so inexpensive and available, um, that m maybe some of the opportunistic core, uh, not non-core strategies are really more akin to core strategies, but they're, uh, they're labeled as something different. I, I, I see this certainly in some of the Asian markets. Um, you know, Japan is one in particular where, you know, it is a core market generally just in terms of the development of the country, but um, we're, we're seeing funds that are getting uh, you know, exceptional uh, excess returns um, from what really are sort of leveraged core strategies. And you touched on this uh, in your presentation. Do, do you think that, that, that this is actually the, the case that uh, opportunist funds are really approaching core strategies and getting fees for opportunistic results? I, I, I largely do, and the reason I, I think so is that generally as we move away from the global financial crisis, the opportunities or the distress that existed in, say, 2010, 2011, 2012, just aren't there anymore. Markets recovered. So at least in the U.S., if you look at commercial real estate values or prices today or, say, pre-COVID relative to their peak before the financial crisis, prices were actually higher, right? And so it's hard in that world to identify uh, opportunities that relate to distress or double digit returns from a pure real estate standpoint, other than doing something like ground up development on a spec basis, right? Or some, investing in some new strategy, uh, I don't know, a few years ago, think about single family rental deals here in the US, you would have, I would have said, there's no way that we can put together an institutional platform uh, to buy and manage single family rental deals and then take that entity public. But for, as one example, Blackstone did exactly that and took their single family rental platform invitation homes public via the REIT market. So, I, I'm very sympathetic to, as we get further away from the financial crisis, there's less and less pure chances, pure number of opportunistic like deals. And those general partners who run those kinds of funds are in a sense forced to buy more core like deals and simply leverage them up. Uh, in which case I sort of point the finger at the limited partners and their consultants for not better understanding that all the general partner is doing is leveraging up a relatively core-like deal, yet the general partner in these opportunistic funds is being paid a promoted or carried interest as if there was some larger real estate uh, effort being made. So I, I do agree with your point, Chris. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think more sort of scrutiny um, certainly would sort of uh, uh, see that, you know, there, 
I, I, many of the returns that have been created are sort of from the market as opposed from the individual um, yeah. strategy around uh, right. the property. And, it, you know, value add is a good example. We're, we're seeing, uh, you know, investors come in uh, and, you know, buy something that they can turn around. You referred to shopping centers or whatever in your presentation uh, yeah. when describing value add. And then typically, um, you know, it would be a need to sell out of that asset uh, fairly quickly to get the, the, the t returns uh, to get the promotes. But uh, often what happens is the investor stays in longer because, you know, the, the, the core, the, the, the market um, continues to push that investment up, whether it's cap rate compression, rising rents or whatever in the market generally. Uh, and then, you know, the underlying sort of LP is paying a fee, um, uh, you know, a higher fee uh, based on um, market events that have not really been because of the manager, unless you you argue, of course, the manager got you into that in the first yeah. place. Uh, Professor, can I ask you, you know, how uh, Chris, sort of... I'm sorry, Chris, I, I'm sorry to do this to you again. I just want to go back to the earlier point for one second, which is to say that in all of these strategies, the bucket in which the strategy to which the strategy is assigned is defined by the general partner. In other words, these are self-reported strategies. I decide I'm going to run an opportunistic fund or a value add fund or a core fund. Generally speaking, within those strategies, there is some style drift over time. So as the market starts to stabilize and returns come down, you'll even see core managers start to take on more risk as a way to measure their returns, excuse me, improve their returns. You might see them do things like engage in the pre-sale, pre-purchase in other words, a to be built, I don't know, apartment complex or industrial property as a way to slightly goose their returns. So yeah. I, I'm just sort of re, uh, reflecting the point you just made before, Chris, before we get into this next topic, which is to say, limited partners and their consultants should really be more analytical about what's going on at the real estate level and the financial structuring level, such that they're just not paying active fees, a promote on a fairly passive strategy and or yeah. strategy shifting over time without the limited partner really understanding how it's shifting. Because you think you buy X, you think you buy safety, core, and the next thing you know, as the financial crisis unravels, half of your core investments are in pre-sale development deals, all of which have lost 25% of their value. Yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut I, you off. No, no, not at all. Thanks for a second. Uh, do you, uh, how important is risk? I mean, do you, do you, is it when you say risk adjusted returns? I mean, uh, risk free today is almost zero um, returns. So, you know, how, how relevant is it? Or, or are investors just really just focused on um, the, the actual return itself? Yeah. No, I, I'm very, as I said before, I'm very sympathetic to the problems of thinking about and measuring risk, particularly when you're talking about looking, making a projection into the future or, and or you have a relatively small sample such that you can't really understand the true riskiness of the strategy. So sm a small sample might be you're only measuring returns in the up portion of a market or a down portion of the market if you don't look over the full cycle, you really don't understand the riskiness of a particular strategy. So I'm, I'm completely sympathetic to the problem. However, I'll, I'll repeat myself by saying, it should be fairly intuitive, intuitive to us in the real estate world that all you have to think about is just leveraging up core and what does that risk return continuum look like in comparison to riskier transactions. Right? We're yep. very comfortable with leverage, and I'm trying to argue uh, with the community at large that we should be more mindful of, of this law of one price as sort of the benchmark by which we think about, is that non-core deal a good or a bad deal? To your point, Chris, it requires us to make some estimates of risk going forward, 
both for the core deal and the non-core deal. But I would argue we get paid for making judgments and we get measured based on those judgments that we've made. No, agree. Um, Professor, I think we're going to ask uh, if there's some questions now um, from those uh, that, that are uh, tuned in this evening. So um, Amos, uh, or I should say Michael actually, uh, is going to um, field those questions. Michael, have we got some questions that uh, have come in? Thanks, Chris. Uh, we did, and we had a number come in before the event as well. Uh, we'll start with one of those. Um, one that came in, uh, to what extent are the findings affected by benchmarking non-core returns against core real estate in a period in which core real estate has had abnormal performance? So could it be that the core real estate just exceeded uh, its performance expectation over this time period from interest rate declines, rents that exceeded uh, uh, replacement cost growth? Could the results change if some of those factors uh, begin to change against core real estate? Well, I would say this is sort of the rising tar tide argument, right? So we've got this rising tide of growing values, rents, falling capitalization rates, falling interest rates. And I would argue it should have benefited both core and non-core real estate alike. Right. And so uh, let me just see if I can find it quickly. What, again, is particularly damning to me is this finding that it doesn't really matter whether you're looking at a period of expanding returns, say, before the financial crisis, or you're looking at a period, a down period after the financial crisis, or you're looking at the entirety of the period, it's very persistent that non-core is underperformed core. And so, yes, I'm sympathetic to the notion that, oh, yeah, of, say, over the last decade, things have been very good for core. They've also been very good for non-core. Right. And as an investor, the issue is, where do I get a bigger bang for my buck? Meaning, where do I get the better risk adjusted net return? And I'm trying to argue in the paper that all you had to do as an investor was leverage up core. And uh, Professor Pagliari, so your results suggest the main driver of the negative alpha is fees. And so a question for, for both you and for Chris, do you have any explanation for how real estate managers have been able to maintain this level of pricing power <laughs> so long? Why hasn't market entry <laughs> peated away the apparent profits? Wow. So, so Michael, you are also not going to make some friends in the private equity real estate world. Uh, I'll answer first and then I'll let Chris correct me. Um, First of all, I would, I would say that these fee models have been around for a long, long time. If you think about, I, I kind of bristle a little bit when I hear about, oh, private equity, leverage buyouts and venture capital, as if they're some relatively new financial instrument. I would argue in the real estate world, we've had these things around for 50, 60, 70 years, right? That there have always been sort of club deals, wealthy investors, wealthy families getting together structuring transactions with a base fee and a promoter carried interest. And it comes right out of, I don't have to tell a booth audience, right out of the principal agent work we talk about in corporate finance. I just don't think that anybody's really taken the time to date to examine whether or not the fees were justified. And in fairness to everybody else, you need a big bucket of data in order to distinguish luck from skill. In other words, we couldn't have meaningfully put this paper together with just say, let's, oh, I don't know, maybe 10 years worth of data. With 18 years worth of data, now the results seem to be more reliable. And I think going forward, there is going to be some pressure on GPs in terms of the, not only their base fees, but as I said before, I think the industry ought to consider some kind of index-based preference rather than a fixed number, typically around 8%. Chris? Yeah, I, you know, I, I would think that um, it, it's, it, it is a, a, a measurement. I, I don't think 
the the level of sort of transparency uh, between what core is returning and uh, what non-core is returning is out there. So it's it's difficult. Uh, I think the professor made a very good point about where funds allocate resources and they'll look at real estate uh, as being an alternative and one where they might want to take more risk and therefore, uh, uh, in inverted commas, uh, away from their fixed income. And, and therefore, when they look at GPs and look at what funds to invest in, they'll naturally be attracted to the ones uh, that are sort of showing greater gross returns, which will be the opportunistic and value add uh, as opposed to the course. So I think there's a natural sort of move uh, in that direction, just with the way that the funds uh, are raised. There's not uh, a reference point. I mean, in the, in the equities market, we have the reference points. We have the indexes of, you know, the stock exchanges. So it's very transparent. It's very easy to measure. Uh, the, the other thing is time as well, because, you know, typically, uh, you know, GPs have sort of closed end funds. So you're measuring the returns over the time of the fund. Uh, a lot of the core investments uh, are more open-ended. Again, the professor referred to this. So you're, you're sort of measuring slightly different uh, times or it's more difficult um, to do that. So that, that would be you know, my, my sense. Um, and then also I, I think you know, we could find the, the research that's been done to date is, uh, as I understand it, focused uh, uh, on the U.S. market, and I, and and it's the it's the market that is covered, um, you know, by GPs. There is a a, a big uh, real estate market outside of GP investing. Uh, if you take all, you know, the the private high net worth developers, etc. Um, and you know, we, we we haven't analyzed their returns, obviously, as well, but. Um, so, you know, I, it, it, it's a big world out there and it's, it's much more difficult to sort of get a grip of relative performance when you've got that sort of big will compared with the equity markets. Um, but, you know, the, the, you know, the, the research that's coming out of Chicago uh, could well be, you know, the start of uh, sort of more scrutiny coming from LPs and then the transparency will come in and, uh, and then that will sort of benefit um the industry more as well and uh, in, including gps you know um they might themselves um start to st start to sort of you know uh reconstruct and look at you know make maybe more core and i'm sorry michael if i could jump in one second i would also say there's there's also been a little resistance to these results from the lps themselves you might have thought that the lps would have said Wow, that's interesting. We've been overpaying for uh, basically uh, subpar performance um, when you think about it in a risk-adjusted net of fees kind of basis. But there's also a certain number of LPs running these big pension plans, as an example, who don't really want to admit to the fact that they've overpaid for subpar performance. So you've got a little bit of that going on as well. And I think it's going to take some time for sort of the old blood to be flushed out and the new blood to sort of come in with these uh, perhaps more rigorous ideas and more rigorous examination of what is positive and negative alpha. Yeah, I, I think, Michael, if I can just add another point as well, of course, you know, we, we're, we, we, this discussion has been around an average. It's, it's, you know, it's the marketplace as a whole. Uh, we, we know there are um, some managers that, you know, are able to outperform um, and certainly we've seen the rise of, you know, s some real mega GPs uh, who can enter the real estate stack differently uh, to other funds. So, you know, here in, um, in Asia, you know, recently we've seen um, um, some uh, GPs buying out operational platforms, teaming up with operational platforms, gives them access to assets, gives them expertise, um, teams on the ground, and then we're seeing exits through public markets. So, uh, and premiums are being paid above the asset value, underlying asset value for the operating platform that's been created. Uh, and those returns should go back to the LPs when those funds close out. So, you know, there are certainly GPs that have advantage because they can enter uh, the, the value stack uh, at, at, all, all, at all levels. 
uh, to extract more value. And maybe one final question, given we're at the top of the hour. Uh, to your point about GPs that are able uh, to extract some value, uh, you know, Professor Paglier, I appreciate uh, the data limitations outside of the U.S. and being able to stratify uh, by geography. Uh, but I wonder, another question for both of you, uh, do you think that these findings would be persistent across geographies, or are there perhaps inefficiencies to be reaped in certain parts of the world? Chris, to your point about uh, GPs accessing in, in different ways. Uh, do you think there are places like uh, Asia or elsewhere in the world uh, that could be a, a good home for capital with bond yields so low as institutions are raising allocation? Could it be that elsewhere in the world these findings don't hold? Uh, I'll, I'll go first if you don't mind, Chris. I, I'm, I am sympathetic to the idea that there is less market efficiency as you move into more emerging type markets. But I also think that that means that there's more dispersion in the outcomes because of these inefficiencies. And some general partners will exploit that profitably, that inefficiency, and some will not, right? So again, you're gonna have this bigger dispersion because of market inefficiencies. I'm not sure that before the investors make their bet, they can tell which GP is going to outperform the other. Chris? Yeah, you know, the fundamentals of real estate are pretty much the same throughout the world. If you think about what drives the returns and what has been driving the returns, it's, you know, it's a capitalization rate, uh, it's the cost of debt and the level of rev uh, debt uh, and the movement in income, which is rent. So they, they apply to, you know, every region uh, and they and they will change and you know, you will get growth in some countries because they're emerging from emerging to develop, but the, the principles are the same. So in theory, the findings should be the same, I think, uh, across uh, all regions. It, it's just going to be much harder in a place like Asia to get the data to be able to, to look at the market so closely. But in theory, it, it feels to me as it should be the same. Great. Thank you, Professor and Chris, for your insightful sharing. I, I thought it was a fascinating session. I personally enjoyed it very much. Thank you very much once again for your time. Thank you. Come to the end of our Thank session you. today. Um, I am aware that we have quite a number of Q&A that we have not gotten to, but nevertheless, we hope you found the session useful. There will be more real estate events in the coming quarters, so do keep a lookout for them. Uh, in the meantime, stay safe and stay healthy. Goodbye.